First of all, I would like to pay my highly respect to lecturer and hello my beloved classmates. We are from group 8 and our topic for this presentation is politics. And we will present to you from page 446 until 457. Now I would like to introduce our group members. So the first speaker is Jab Supanat, and the second speaker is Sakong Persiliap, and the last speaker is Hon Heng Sokliap. Now before we move on to our presentation, I would like to introduce to you our contents. So the first part is who rules the United States, and the second one is war and terrorism implementing political objectives and the third one is a new world order and now I would like to pass the stage to the first speaker which is a uh, Jab Sopanoid okay so now let's start from my part so I'm responsible for who rules the United States People form a government and give it to monopoly on, on violence to protect themselves from oppressors. However, the risk is that the state can turn that force and against its own citizens. And people must find a balance between having no government. This would lead to anarchy. So the meanings of anarchy is a condition of disorder and violence and having a government that protects them from violence but it also may turn against them. However, if it is functioning well, the state is a balanced system that protects its citizens from both one another and from government. One another here meaning that oppressor and pluralism the meaning of pluralism a diffusion of power among many special interest groups prevents any one group from gaining control of the government and using it to oppress the people next in order to keep government from coming under the control of any group the founders of the United States set up three branches of government. The first branch is, as you can see in the slide, the executive branch, the power of the president, the judiciary branch, the powers of the courts, and the legislative branch. Each in the branch is sworn to uphold the constitution and also guarantees rights to citizens and each one of the brands um, have mistakes the two can invalidate the one that have mistakes the system known as checks and balance like I put in the note here checks and balance was designed to ensure that no one branch of government dominates two others. They have the same right and no one can dominate other or can control two others because they have the same right of it. Next, let's go to the complex perspective of the power elite. According to the sociologist Ryan Mears in 1957 took the position that the country's most important matters are not decided by lodges or even by Congress. The decisions that have the greatest impact on the lives of Americans and people across the world are made by a power lead. The meaning of power lead consists of the top leaders of the largest corporations, the most powerful generals and admirers of the armed forces, and certain elite politicians, or the president, the president's cabinet, 
and senior members of Congress who chair the major committees. So all of them who control power and make decisions and also can shape the world. So whether the three groups that make up the power elite like the top business, politician and military leaders, they have equal right. Based on the remarks say that they are not and the most power he said are the corporate leaders. Because all three segments are the power elite view corporation are essential to the welfare of the country. If you look at the picture here, power in the United States, the motor proposed by C. Wright Mills. So here most power and to the least power. So move on to reviews is right. Between functionalist and complete perspective, both of them cannot dominate others because they have their own level. And according to the sociologist saying that they don't have any proof to answer for this question yet. So next, let's go to war and terrorism implementing political objectives. Some people may wonder that why this topic the writer includes about the war and terrorism in the politics studies. Because war and terrorism are tools used to try to accomplish political goals. So go to the next slide. The meaning of war. War is a conflict between nations or political distinct groups. It's simply one option that groups choose for dealing with disagreements. However, not all societies choose these options of war. Like based on the slide here, you see there are uh, so about the picture of wars, however, some nations they can deal the problem without using the word for war. And next, how common is war? Humanities always seek for peace while at the same time they glorify war, and this actually people really glorify war. So, this may ask for the question. But if you read the history, you will find a recounting of a group's major battles. And even in the country, you can see monuments to generals, the battles scattered throughout the land. So in May Day, pirates in Moscow's Red Square to the 4th of July celebrations in the United States and the Cinco de Mago victory march in Mexico. War and revolution are interwoven in the slavage of national life. So go to why nation go to war? This will be presented by Salib, my group member. And thank you for your pay attention. So now let us look at why nations go to war. According to sociologist Nicholas Timashev, there are three essential conditions which were used to analyze war. The first is an antagonistic situation in which two or more states confront incompatible objectives, meaning each may want the same land or resources. The second is a cultural tradition of war. Because their nations have fought war in the past, so they always see war as the only option for dealing with serious dispute with other nations. The third is a few that hit the antagonistic situation to a boiling point. There are seven few which the country's leader want to achieve from war. 
The first one is revenge, meaning setting old score from earlier conflicts. The second one is power, means to rule over with country. The third one is prestige, meaning to defend the nation's honor. The fourth is unity, to unite rival group within their country. The fifth is positions, means to protect the leader's positions. Um, number six is ethnicity, is to bring enemy under their rule. And the last one is beliefs, to forcibly converting other to have the same political beliefs. Move on to cause of war. There are three cause of war in this chapter. The first one is cause of life, which is a higher capacity to inflict death. For example, the United States fought in Vietnam at a cost of 59,000 American and about 2 million Vietnamese lives. And the second one is cost of property, which mainly focus on money. Example in the textbook have shown that the United States has spent $8 trillion on 12 of its war. And the last one is uh, a special cost of war dehumanizations. Now let us take a closer look at a special cause of war. What is dehumanization? Dehumanization is the act or process of reducing people to objects that do not deserve to be treated as human. This simply applies to how a good soldier who had to be cruel toward their enemies or prisoner during the war. War exacts many costs in addition to killing people and destroying property. One of the most remarkable is its effect on morality. Exposure to brutality and killing often causes dehumanization, and this dehumanization leads to being guilty. For instance, after returning home, the dehumanizing definition can break down and many soldiers find themselves disturbed by what they did during the war. One of the soldiers from California who wrote this note before putting a bullet through his brain, Smith 1980, saying, I can't sleep anymore. When I was in Vietnam, we came across a North Vietnamese soldier with a man, a woman, and a three or four years old girl. We had to shoot them all. I can't get the little girl's face out of my mind. I hope God will forgive me. I can't. To help understand how this occur, let us look at the down-to-earth sociology book in the textbook which study how can good people torture others. We learn in this down-to-earth sociology book that the soldiers who torture and murder others were ordinary good people who just follow orders from someone and when they finish their work, they go home to their families where they are ordinary fathers and husbands. So how were they able to torture the prisoners and still feel good about themselves? To understand this, we must look at the characteristics of dehumanizations. The first one is increased emotional distance from others, meaning to stop seeing other people as human but as objects or animals. Number two is emphasis on following orders, um, meaning to say that it is a soldier's duty so they have to follow it and torture others. Number three, inability to resist pressures. Number four, a dimi diminished sense of personal responsibility. Um, number three and number four is similar to number two because um, it means they have to follow the order because they fear of losing their job and they are in a low position. So who are they to question this act? And number five, blame on victims. It's to say that if the victim confessed in the first place, the soldier wouldn't have tortured them. And number six, a technique of neutralization was to say that what they authorized was not torture. Move on to my last part which is terrorism. What does terrorism mean? 
Terrorism is the use of violence or the threat of violence to produce fear in order to bring about political objectives. Usually, terrorism is one option for a weak country who is unable to meet its more powerful opponent on the battlefield. For example, Mustafa Jabba in Najaf, Iraq, is proud of his firstborn, a baby boy. He said, "I will put mines in the baby and blow him up." Sometimes, stronger groups use terrorism too. It is not because they have no options. But because they can, suicide terrorism is a weapon sometimes chosen by the weaker group, and we can learn from the down-to-earth sociology book in the textbook that some of the suicide terrorists are people from the background of poverty, such as women and children, while some are intelligent, educated, professional, and religious people. And that is the end of my part. The next part, which is Solving the seeds of the future wars and terrorism will be presented by a uh, Soklip. Solving the seeds of future wars and terrorism. Weapons could be signs of might, power, prestige, or or protection. Every country need it so that the government could protect its own country from other country invasion, or use the weapons to show off their might or power. However, selling advanced weapons to the least industrialized nations equal in sowing the seeds of future wars and terrorism. When a least industrialized nation buys high-tech weapons, its neighbor get nervous about its own safety. As a result, it could spark an arms race among them. Now, let's take a look at Table Fifteen Point Four, which show that the United States is the chief merchant of debt. Following by Russia and Great Britain, places to stand second and third. This step also shows the major customers in the business of debt. There are two interesting matters to look at. First, India, where the average annual income for each citizen is only six hundred dollars, and Egypt, where it is only one thousand five hundred dollars, are some of the world's biggest spenders on arms or weapons. The second interesting matter is that. The huge purchase of arms by Saudi Arabia indicate that the U.S. dollars that the United States spend on buying the oil from Saudi Arabia tend to return to the United States. There is, in reality, an exchange of arms for oil, with dollars the medium of exchange. The seeds of future wars and terrorism are also sown by nuclear proliferation. Among least industrialized nations, such as Pakistan, whose head of nuclear development sold the blueprint for atomic bombs to North Korea, Libya, and Iran. After that, Iran and North Korea are furiously following those blueprints, trying their best to develop their own nuclear weapons. If those nuclear, if those weapons are in the hands of terrorists. Who hold on tightly to their belief and want others to become like them, or a dictator who want to set out the grudge, whether nationalistic or personal, this weapon can mean nuclear blackmail or nuclear destructions or both. So let's move on to the next part, which is about um, down to earth sociology, Charles Sudiers. It is a memoir. Written by Asmir Bear, 2007. Um, it is about uh, his experience as a child soldier in his village, Sierra Leone. The story starts in 1993. Ishmael was a 12 years old boy when he fled from his village, Sierra Leone, to the jungle after he was attacked by the bears. With no place to go, and rebels attacking the village, killing, looting, and raping. Ishmael continued to hide in the jungle. One day, he peered out from his hiding place at the village, and he saw a rebel carrying the head of a man, which he held by the hair, with blood dripping from where the neck had been cut. 
and when he returned, he found his family dead and his village burned. Months later, government saw the army to find Ishmael. He was brainwashed and manipulated by soldiers to join army units. In time of taking revenge for his family, and he was forced to use guns and drugs. Although Ishmael's ability to learn was short, but his hate for rebels is a strong motivator for him. Along with 30 other boys, Ishmael was trained to shoot and clean an AK-47. At first, killing was difficult, but later on, after a while, he was getting used to it. He managed to kill rebel that was caught by the Saudi Earth as a prisoner, as a prisoner in one fluke motion. Later on, his life was surrounding with killing and attacking village in order to search for food, drugs, ammunition, and gasoline that his team needed. Later on, Ishmael managed to leave the darkness of his life. As among many hundreds of thousands of child soldiers worldwide, he was a lucky one to be sure. And Gilwen's a counseling at a UNICEF rehabilitation center. He has also had a remarkable turn of fate of graduating from college in the United States and becoming a permanent U.S. resident. Another part is making enrichments and protecting interests. The Sudan which has most powerful and most technologically advanced nations such as Canada, France, Germany, Britain, Italy, Japan, and the United States. Farmer looks alien, which they call G7 or the Group of Seven. The goal of these alignments was to coordinate their activities just so that they could maintain their global dominance divide up the world market and regulate global economic activities. Although Russia did not qualify for the memberships on the basics of wealth, power, or technology, the other nation feared Russia's nuclear essential. Thus, Russia was invited and became a full member in 2002. And the organization is now all G8. As China has increased both its economic cloud and its nuclear sensor, it also has been invited to be an observer, a form of trail membership. G8 Zun to be G9 may be a force for peace if these nations can agree on how to divide up the world's markets and force weak nations to cooperate. However, dissension or dispute became apparent in 2003. On several occasions, U.S. officials have vowed that the United States will not allow Iran to become, to become a nuclear power. But when the United States attacked Iraq with the support of only Great Britain and Italy from this group, from this, it does not take much for us to imagine or to foresee the implication of this current alignment, such as the encouragement of cooperative puppet governments that support the interests of G8, the threat of violence to those that do not cooperate, and the inevitable resistance including the use of terrorism of various ethnic groups to the dominance of this more powerful country. Just with this condition in place, the perpetuation of war and terrorism is currently. So, let us continue with the next part. A new world order? War and terrorism, accompanied by torture and dehumanization, are tools that some nations use to dominate other nations. But, the use of war and terrorism to dominate other nations or the globe has failed. However, in a new world order, people change direction, not to use war, but to turn in nation cooperating for economic reasons. We have the key events that we already heard of happening in our era is the globalization of capitalism. 
The next part, I'm going to talk about trends toward unity. As the world nations are frantically embracing capitalism, they are forming cooperative economic political units, such as North American Free Trade Association, in short, an AFTA, was formed by the United States, Canada, and Mexico. A regional trading partnership called ASEAN, World Trade Organization or WTO, and the European Union or EU consisted of 27 European countries. This nation have adopted a single cross-national currency, the Euro, and has also established a military staff in Brussels, Belgium. As you can see, in order to gain more interest for themselves, many countries are trying to form cooperative units or associations. So, could this process continue until there is just one state or empire that evolved the earth? Well, it is possible. Just like, for example, the United Nations. The United Nations is striving to become or to have the power to make law or to be a world government. It won its decision to supersede or have authority over those of any individual nation. The UN or the United Nations also operate a world court formerly titled the International Court of Justice and a rudimentary army. And it used this army to sense the peacekeeping the so-called peacekeeping troops to serve our nation. Last but not least, strains in the global system. Although the globalization of capitalism and its surrounding trade organizations could lead to a single world government, the strains or forces from capitalism or a trade organization or many more in the developing global systems are so great that they threaten to rip the system apart. Well, it, is, it certainly isn't easy to maintain global certification or the classifications of people. So the unresolved item constantly rise up, demanding realignments of the current arrangement of power. Although those pressures are resolved on a short term basic, over time it could Accum well, it could accumulate to a new mix that leads to a great dual shift in a global stratification. If we take a look at the broad human history, we can see that the group of people or culture can dominate only for a um, certain amount of time. They always come to an end to be replaced by another group or culture. The process of declines is usually slow and can last hundreds of years. But in over speed up existence, the future looms into the present at a furious rate by Toynbee, 1946. From the look of this, we can see that the declines of dominance of present powerful country could happen in the future. Well, it is certainly not without on resistance or bloodshed. What the new political arrangement of world power will look like is anyone's guess. Although there are indications that point to um, ascendancy of China, since there are signs of growth of its um, economics and nuclear sensor. But one thing is for sure is that um, the political arrangement of present could like um, will give way, creating a new world and um, paving a new path for future generation. And this is the summary of the main points of this presentation. So please take a moment to look at it and then try to recall if you remember some of this point in our presentations. And this has come to an end of our presentation. So thank you for taking your precious time to listen to our video.